What's up, kittens? Grand rising, grand afternoon, grand evening, wherever you are in the world. I, when I was preparing my tea for, to sit down and record this, this is what it says. The worst enemy we have is our own fear. And I was like, okay, ancestors, I hear you, I hear you, because I knew that I wanted to record what I'm going to share today all day. I knew I've known for a couple of days because I said to myself, okay, September 1st is going to be where I jump in and I'm going to do my best to record every day for the month of September and just share out some of the things that I have been learning and integrating and really just setting my mindset to one of love and one of a growth mindset and one that is really has been serving me to continue to maintain my wish fulfilled mindset and to not allow the secular world the 3d to bog me down when in the past my behavior patterns would have been exactly that there would have been a lot of hectic energy a lot of frenetic frantic energy of oh my gosh the 3d is reflecting back not what i want that it's reflecting back decisions consequences repercussions however you want to frame it of decisions of past me and not always reflective of where I am now as present and future me. So I am owning, I am embodying, I am declaring Operation Unbothered as my official mindset that is going to continue to support my exaltation into my highest aligned reality with Source to continue to compost all of the information that I'm both receiving externally and the things that I'm working on internally with my inner child, with my shadow self, just my behavioral patterns, uh, interge intergenerational traumas, and all of that. Just I'm unbothered by what the 3D is promoting to me, is showing to me, is reflecting to me because I now trust and internally validate myself that I know that the tools that I have are the tools that I need to support me right here right now where I am and where I'm going and I'm so grateful and thankful for all of the experiences that I like to uh, compare to as pieces of sand on a beach that have allowed me to create this beach of my life and be here right now um, so yeah I'm gonna jump right in I am this is the first time I'm doing this. So I'm really just trying to figure out like how I even want to flow about this. Um, so I have my laptop, I have my notebook, I have the book that I'm going to read from and really just share out um, where I'm at and, and how I've been able to integrate these different practices. I've been getting reflected a lot back in my life recently of it's all great if there's theory it's and there's a lot of hypothesizing that can go on until the universe provides an opportunity to actually put the put me in that position to say like okay these are the skills that I have like are they actually working because even I really even what I've experienced and realized is that even sometimes when I have uh, tools it doesn't mean that it's necessarily relating to what it is that I need in that moment they might not actually be good tools for me and they might have been tools that like I've, I, I, you, I'm a big YouTube University student so maybe it's someone something that I saw on YouTube maybe it's something that I read in a book maybe it's something I heard on a podcast like it could mean so many different things and until I have the opportunity to actually try it out to see if it works I don't know I, I can only hypothesize and sometimes these things don't work so this is just my lived experience me just sharing out um, how I have been able to embody and actively practice Operation Unbothered, which is truly just ignoring what is going on in the 3D and composting these experiences to continue to elevate and align. And I like to think of all of the chakras of them being in one line. And when I am meditating, I think about almost cleaning out the gunk 
making sure that it is a straight line all the way through or all the way up uh, that I'm able to actually experience and receive in the divine alignment and the divine understanding of and instructions so I can be obedient, so I can be in the position to do what it is that my highest self needs me to do now in the present to support where I'm going in the future. All right, I was doing a little sound check, so we're back. Um, so the book that I have been integrating into my morning routine is A Course in Miracles, the complete and annotated uh, version that is coming out of the Circle of Atonement. And I first learned about this book through Rebecca Lynn Pope, where she talked about um, Alan Cohen's version, A Course of, in Miracles Made Easy, which is a book that I have it on the audio so I do try to listen to that book at least twice a year since I have known about it um, I think it is a really solid book of almost like a spiritual cliff notes if you will for this text this text really um, there's a lot here there's a lot to contemplate and I have been taking my time going through it reading about 15 to 30 minutes every morning um, and really just allowing myself to enjoy and under and contemplate and marinate and allow the information that is coming through because this book and this is for any book this is for any piece of content whether it be a podcast or a song it's going to resonate with everyone's soul in a different way and for me I am appreciative that I have the time that I am able to really go through this at a pace that is a is in alignment with me getting the messages that I need. So I wanted to start off with this one quote because I think that this is definitely um, very much um, in alignment of why this book is speaking to me so much. So it says, the wisdom he taught was not a conventional wisdom that set forth, set forth bland moral precepts. Rather, it was a subversive wisdom that overturned his audience's most basic assumptions about life and beckoned them to enter into a radically new perception of reality. And they're talking about historical Jesus. And throughout the book, it is, a, it is in the language of Christianity with a very large, I think that's like a minor undertone in comparison to just the overall message of love and having a love first focused mindset to recognize that all of us, all of <laughs> that in this quantum field, that all of the souls that are having this human experience, we've all come from the same source. We've all come from the same place, that we are just fragments of that whole creative energy. And for me, I believe that we are in a simulation. I think a lot of times that we are experiencing Super Mario Brothers, um, all the levels, which has always been very funny because that was a game that I played a lot with my brother growing up so seeing that like as an adult being reflected back very frequently um, I think that also has to do with my own programming my own experiences so really it's this caveat of take what resonates and leave the rest and I do hope that you're just open to this experience of maybe there's something that I will share that will support you on your own journey because at the end of the day I'm learning too and I was hesitant at first to even start recording and talking about this book because I was like, oh, I got to get through the whole text to be able to share it out. And I mean, I literally no annotate and take notes and are making so many connections on a daily basis that I'm just like, let me just try it. Let's just see how this goes. It doesn't have to be perfect um, because this is really just me speaking from my own experience. Um, OK, so let me check my notes here. What do I want to talk about? The biggest thing I wanted to share was, well, not the biggest thing. One of the things that I wanted to start off this whole September recording and sharing out about A Course in Miracles is my own journey from being a recovering codependent. And I was recently watching uh, Women of Impact with Lisa Bilyeu and, oh gosh, I didn't write down her last name. Her one of, I'll link the, the episode below. Um, the psychologist Celia was talking about um, essentially the spectrum of narcissism and people pleasing or victimhood and how much they are the same um, gosh I think it's Oscar Wilde that has the quote of life and death are 
different perspectives of the same thread. And she's explaining in this uh, Women of Impact uh, episode about just that, about how narcissism and people pleasing are, well, excuse me, I'm using the word people pleasing. She used the words victimhood. Victimhood and narcissist, they are sharing the same thread, that it's this overindulgence of oneself. It's just that the motivation is different. And as a recovering codependent, this was like, oh, yeah, that resonates a lot because I was willing to self-sacrifice in order to gain attention, to gain resources, to gain love, to gain attention, whatever it may be, that was my motivator. And similarly with a narcissist, uh, which I've experienced throughout my, my so far lifespan of there are behaviors that all behaviors communication and there are behaviors that are communicating something. And at the end of the day, it is both trying to manipulate a situation to get attention, whether there is a lack of self-esteem, um, a lack of knowing how to even communicate that, a lack of awareness, uh, just childhood programming, uh, so societal, cultural uh, programming to be in these labels of either victimhood or a narcissist. So for me, I had taken notes that on one side where the victimhood is, is that people pleasing where I have been uh, in that codependent relationships. And again, with all different types of relationships, whether it's business, whether it's ro uh, romantic, intimate, um, or even family members. And then the other side being that narcissist with I for my own personal experiences, I liken that to being a succubus or an incubus where there's someone that I'm here to, I was willing to just give away my love and light and my own resources, which time, energy, consideration uh, for another person to essentially suck that energy out of me. And just that being unequally yoked, that unbalance, that imbalance of that energy exchange. And in the middle, I wrote secure attachment because at the end, like, that's where I am now. And that's where that Operation Unbothered comes from because I am so securely in that center of that secure attachment with myself that I'm internally validating myself that I no longer am needing to reach outward to get that. I know that if I'm feeling any sort of disharmony, I can turn into inward and also reflect back to source to be like, what is this repeat patterning of something from that I have and work have worked through and am working through what is this trying to tell me what is it that I'm being activated by um so yeah that's where I wanted to start and I wrote that people pleasing self-sacrifice in order to attempt to obtain the external validation from others and then also to consider the mirroring energies who are also people pleasing from the other end of the spectrum so for me I, I'm really reflecting on these past experiences of when I've been a people pleaser and I have been squarely in that victimhood mentality, uh, not wanting to internally say like, yo bro, um, let's just talk about how the fact that I'm not pouring fresh water in my own life. I'm expecting somebody else to do that. And it's difficult for people who are experiencing from my perspective. I think it's difficult for somebody who is on either side of this insatiable black hole of needing love, needing validation, needing other people's resources, whether it is the person giving or receiving, there's still that imbalance, that unequally yoked um, dance that's going on. Um, and let's see, what else did I write? Oh, so this is directly from A Course in Miracles, is anyone who is unable to leave the request of others unanswered has not entirely transcended egocentricity. And I was like, dang, <laughs> this channel message is accurate. Because when I reflect back on my codependency behaviors and where I can be a people pleaser, that is a major, major, major part of it is I would, first off, I'm not a mind reader. And I don't think anybody is a mind reader. I think that there is intuitive kindness and love that when someone is coming from that position of love, when they're love focused, love first, that there is that intuitive connection of, uh, even Lisa Billy was talking about how an example with her and her husband of where actually reverse. Cause I watched both episodes, the one that the psychologist Sadia did with Lisa Billy and then the one that she did with 
uh, Lisa's husband, Tom, and Tom was saying that he, he had, like, forgotten to, like, take out his chicken for his dinner that night, and Lisa had taken that out, and I don't consider that to be a mind reading thing. I think that is, I, I liken that to being a genuine, intuitive love first, where here's somebody who knows that this person was going to do something and they forgot for whatever reason, and then being considerate and being like, okay, let me just help them out. I'm going to do this from a place of love, not expectation, and not having the mindset of, well, I'm going to do this because I want this. It's more of, I'm going to do this because I know that this person is going to feel loved, going to feel considered, going to feel appreciated, that I recognize that this was happening. I'm going to just pause this really quick because it's getting very dark outside and I'm going to put the light on. BRB. I'm grateful that the light kind of gives me this like angelic glow right now. I'm here for it. So this sense of recalibrating even in myself of what is a codependent behavior what is a love first love focused behavior um and what else did i write here oh this was something that i this was a article that i found today that was um by cresswell et al from 2005 and the peer review article is affirmation affirmation of personal value buffers neuro <laughs> neuroendocrine and psychological stress responses and what i pulled from that was this sentence or two no that's a comma not a period <laughs> the present findings suggest that strong self resources especially when coupled with an affirmation of personal values protect against psychological reactions of stressful events so in relation to the codependency and the people pleasing behaviors something that i knew that i now can reflect and take radical accountability for is that i did not have those strong self resources i was willing to be a chameleon i was willing to just react based off of the person who i was at that time whoever it may have been work intimate relationships friendships even the general public of that sense of trying to mind read, which I always like to joke and say that I have a 50, 50, um, rate of accuracy, which in my world is not enough of an accuracy to be trying to say like, I am mastering that skill. I, it's not, that's the joke. It's sarcasm. It's not a good ratio of 50, 50. And even in those times where maybe there was a couple of, uh, maybe I got it like three times in a row in behavior science, that is, um, variable reinforcement. So even if similarly to gambling, you know, like you're pulling the slot machine, you might get it three times. And then the fourth time it could be a blow up argument. It could be that you just lost all the money that you thought all the money you won plus your own money. So it's this sense of having that again those really strong boundaries to be like okay is this a codependent relationship move or is this coming from a place of high value um internal validation and what i really liked about this article is that it was um and i found this article because i was watching a diary of a ceo and they love that podcast and youtube channel um he also has one that's like clips so there was someone that the clip was like uh gosh I think her last name was Cuddy, which I really liked because she was talking about relationships and I was like, cuddly, Cuddy. So I'll link that below as well. Of what she was sharing was this, um, this social psychology uh, exercise that people will do where essentially you are prompted without knowing to talk about a couple of your values and then you're given an unrelated task. And what they've shown in the, in the studies is that when people are exceptionally, exceptionally, essentially, cognitively, positively priming themselves, they end up doing much better on the activity because of the fact that their self-identity is so rooted in their values because they've already said like, oh, this is my value, that it doesn't matter what the external experience is, even if it is a really difficult task for them. Maybe it's even a task they don't even know what they're doing. It's the fact that they've been primed to know that, okay, first, this is who I am, and then this other experience is external. It has nothing to do with me necessarily. Um, it might be 
grading or rating somebody's proficiency in math or reading. However, the person is able to disconnect from the outcome of that exercise because they've already primed themselves, they've already rooted themselves in their values. And somebody's values, my values, are the foundation of who I am and is going to be the moral compass in which I move in this dimension. So suggestion would be to consider what are your values and in a time of thinking that something difficult might be coming up whether it's a job interview or maybe even you're breaking up with somebody and that could be friends or um, a job or an intimate relationship of reminding yourself of your values so that way no matter what that emotional because again like this is everyone has free will and uh, the Course of Miracles talks about that all the time is that we all have free will and it's up to us to determine if we're going to be obedient to source and be obedient to what is being downloaded into us or are we going to be lost in the sauce here in the 3D secular experience. I kind of got a little distracted, went on a little bit of a tangent. It's totally cool. It's how I roll anyways. Um, yes. So really rooting oneself in the values in order. Oh, that's what I was talking about well commenting on is the sense of if somebody is rooted in their values the emotional response of somebody else is the free will of that person and it's equally the free will of the person who is who is the person saying it and then receiving like I'm unbothered so if somebody doesn't like what it is that I'm saying to them if I've said it non-violently if I said it loving with loving kindness and I've said it in a way that is expressing my own boundaries and my own wants and my own needs, I am accepting that that person does not have to reciprocate that. They don't even have to accept that. I They don't even have to acknowledge or affirm what it is that I, I've shared. The sense is more that I also do not have to take on their response. And as a recovering codependent and as a recovering people pleaser, that would be something that would completely change the temperature within my own universe. If some, if I said something, and a lot of times I wouldn't even say something. I would be um, scared. I'd be in fear of that rejection of, is that person going to take away that love and affection? Is that person going to think poorly of me? Or whatever it may be. And through the work of and composting of all these experiences and coming to the conclusion of I need to internally validate myself in order to be in the position that I am unbothered has literally changed the game for me completely changed the game for me and it makes me feel so really great inside because I know that no matter what somebody says to me I can also with loving kindness give them the space and grace that they may need because I recognize that the more that I am evolving does not mean that everybody is evolving at the same time as me maybe they have different resources maybe they have different intentions maybe they have different values like this is something that is very important to me because as I continue to align with source and be in the position to carry out my divine purpose I I need to be unbothered by what other people are going to say because otherwise I could be in the position of taking on other people's judgments, taking on other people's um, negativity, other people's fears and their own values even. Like I can think of many times where I've shared with people like, oh, I'm going to be doing this or I'm going to be doing that. And it's like, oh, why are you going to do that? What is that all about? And it's like, bro, I get that maybe in your universe, this is not aligned. However, in my universe, this is something that I'm willing to take a chance on and vice versa. There's been a time, I love how like my face is like literally, it's making me think of, uh, wow, it's really cool because it's like the symbolism of the fact that like I can only see half my face is making me think of Two-Faced from Batman. And it's like this sense of the duality even within myself of this constant, moving and energy of what is in the light and then and the darkness which I really will liken to the the third dimension right now because I think there's a lot of chaos going on um nevertheless I continue on of yeah I just like actually I'm just like whoa the duality of my of the lighting is very interesting yes I just looked down at the at A Course in Miracles and this is literally the sentence Like many other sages, Jesus lays before his audiences two pathways. And I'm over here talking about duality. Talk about divine intervention and downloads right here, right now. 
Um, okay, I want to finish this up. I wanted to make sure that I talk about everything that I said. Oh, I just wanted to share as well that where I am in A Course in Miracles right now is that I'm up to chapter three. Um, I'm reading between 15 and 30 minutes every day. And I've integrated into my morning routine, which has been really helpful because I feel like I am... I have a very extensive morning routine and I like that I'm able to like finish my time up with reading this because it allows me to have something to contemplate throughout the day. Um, so that by the end of the day, I'm able to see how has the universe provided me additional option opportunities and examples to integrate what it is that I have been reading. Um, okay. Let's see what I have here. Oh, a major thing that for the people pleasing experience, um, as I check my notes, is um, reinforcing the energetic principle of that nothing wrong has happened. And I know personally that I have experienced some very curious, um, Kundalini uh, inspiring experiences where I've literally been like, what in the actual heck is going on? And I have radical accountability. I know that my soul has chosen to be in these positions to learn the lessons that I needed to learn so I could be right here, right now, even reflecting in this conversation. And a lot of times in the past, I would be so um, eager to blame externally rather than take the accountability internally to say like, bro, no, like you also played a part in this experience. So what can I do? What can I learn from these lessons to turn them into blessings? And that really no harm has, is no wrong is ever done. It really is that, in my opinion, that all relationships are energetic exchanges. And a lot of times I don't even use the word relationships anymore. I use the word um, energetic exchanges. I'm just going to move this over. Let's see. I use that term because that to me is what it is, is that I'm not always the one needing to learn the lesson. Sometimes I am the conduit to support somebody else in learning the lesson that they need to learn to be on their journey, on their path. And sometimes I overstay my welcome. And that has happened with several past relationships where I've been connected for too long. And then I need to, as uh, Lacey Phillips from To Be Magnetic says, be earthquaked out of that experience because my lessons, I've learned the lessons. I have completed my my task there and sometimes and that's the reverse as well is that even if I'm staying there the other person maybe their time is also up in my life and they have already done all they they needed to do and all the learning that they were going to have and all the support they were going to give me that it needs to be earthquake and broken apart so that way the journey for each soul can continue to be mirrors for other people so the journey can continue going and the evolution can continue to happen um, a few things about me is I am a special ed teacher. I also am studying behavior uh, science and I like to incorporate quantum physics, different types of uh, learning pedagogies and behavior science along with spirituality and into the experience because that's the languages in which I speak that I understand and the content that I like to have. So one of the other things that I put was be a data collector of, and that really is another way to say, observe your thoughts for me to observe my thoughts, observe my behaviors and to see like, what is it that I'm doing when I'm in these different situations? What is it that other people are doing that is activating my responses within me? And that no is a full sentence. And one of the footnotes, uh, one of the pages, I'll find it and, and note it here, is that it's a If you've seen any of my videos before, you know that my affirmation alarms typically go off at very di various times based on different angel numbers. So sometimes the video just stops. And it's like the, the universe is like, okay, take a breath, let's reset. So I'm gonna start from where I just was and say, that this is a footnote paraphrase where it says Edgar Case gave more readings than his bodysuit, mind, and spirit could handle, and then he died at 67. And the consideration for this is driven to sacrifice in order to make up for this perceived lack of worth. 
And again, circling back to that codependency, that people pleasing, um, just cannot, I cannot pour from a dry cup. I cannot pour from a cup that does not have overflowing fresh water from there because anything that I would be giving to somebody else is not going to be the highest quality, isn't going to be the highest um, support for somebody because I am not supporting myself. And I thought that was really interesting about the Edward Edgar case because what he was doing is he was um, prophetic and he was supporting uh, sick children and he didn't take care of himself. So we ended up dying really young because he just kept giving, giving, giving. And in that sense of being a people pleaser, it's like, where does one draw the line? Where does one finally say like, no, this is my boundary. I'm not going to continue going forward with self-sacrifice. I don't need to be a martyr to do my part to save the world. I need to, in order to do my part to save the world, I actually need to take care of myself. I need to be aware of my own internal feelings, my own activations, my own self-care menu of how can I continue to pour fresh water and nourish myself before I'm able to actually do that with somebody else or with other people. And, you know, for me, it was like kind of a bummer doodle that, you know, in the sense for Edgar Cayce and you know, rest in power that his life story is able to provide that direct example of what does it mean when somebody does not take care of themselves, when someone is willing to continue to pour out, pour out, pour out, and not consider, wait a minute, is this benefiting me? Do I even have the ability, the tools, the resources to continue to be acting in this way? And that goes right back to that, um, the ego of, the ego will say, no, keep doing this, keep doing this for, for external validation and affirmation and love and accolades and whatever it may be that that person is desiring to receive externally when perhaps the internal self is saying like, bruh, you've already met your quota. Like, you don't have to keep going like this. We need to take a pause. We need to take a break. We need to recalibrate. We need to consider. And for me, like, I think about how for myself, my low, my former my past self's low self-worth in the area of finances, that was the area that I would allow people to suck me dry in because I was like just willing to keep giving and giving and giving and having no boundaries. And because of my past self, the repercussions of that are still to this day healing from that and working through choices that I have made in the past that where I am here now, I understand that these are all pieces of sand on my beach to be here right now um however it's that sense of ah oh, man like we could have done things way differently and now I know moving forward how to act differently how to be able to release that poverty mindset release that codependency release that scarcity release that need to show love through money and reprogram what that intergenerational trauma has been in my own family units so that will be a video for one of these September days. Um, let's see. All right. I'm going to be finished this up because I have no idea how long this video even is. And there are mosquitoes starting to come out. And I'm not interested in those ancestors eating me. Um, let's see. What else? What else? Okay. I'm going to end with this. Kind of circling back. Tying this up with a nice little bow. Um, being a data collector in the sense of if someone cannot accept your no, they can go. And if someone accepts your no, there is a level of respect and consideration of your boundaries. So I'm going to say that again. If someone cannot accept your no, they can go. And if someone can accept your no, then they are honoring your boundaries. And then it's going to take it one more step forward with the data collection in this sense of if the person is genuinely accepting your no, then there will be no sort of retaliation. There will be no cold shoulder. There will be no icing out. There will be no snide remarks. There will be genuine love. And that is why I love this book, A Course in Miracles, because the entire book is about composting the fear that this secular dimension continuously tries to program into people and also to have that separation of all the souls having a human experience and bringing everyone together through the one true truth, love. There is always light in the world. 
There's always light in the world. There will be areas of darkness and that's okay. It is up to the people who choose to accept the calling, to accept the responsibility to be a light in those dark spaces because no matter what, there can always be light. There's always can be a moment of joy. There can always be a moment of peace, a, a moment of gratitude. And that is what has really helped me on this journey of being able to say like, I'm going to see internally what that feels like. What is that joy? What is that love? What is that gratitude? And I'm going to leave y'all with this committed action step of, I think that, and there's a lot of research, which I'm sure I can find a ton of articles about gratitude and how for me, because a lot of times I'm just like, I love notebooks and I love taking notes. I'm just not, I've never been really solid and consistent and persistent with doing a gratitude, like writing it down. So I use my cell phone in the signal app to do a visual gratitude list. So every night I write the date I write today. I'm grateful for, I list at least three things. Sometimes depending on how tired I am, maybe I'm just writing like a word, a couple of words. And then I'm attaching photos that I've taken throughout the day. And sometimes there's only a couple of photos. Sometimes there's a couple of screenshots. It's just this sense of taking that time to pause and reflect on what was my day like so I can continue to have the data to show that I live a joyful life, that I live an abundant life, that I live a life that is meaningful to me because I continue every day to make the choices to live a life that is in alignment with my highest self within my highest divine purpose here. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up because it is raining and I have quite a bit of tech out right now. Um, this was really fun and I am want to just like say shout out to myself for showing up for myself. Thankful and grateful that today's my first day of doing this and I look forward for the next 29 days to continue to share out what it is that I'm learning from A Course in Miracles, other content that is coming up and I'll be sure to link everything below and I want to say thank you for spending your time here with me. Um, that is one of the currencies in this dimension that is not infinite time here and I will I'm looking forward to actually talking a lot lol that was the timer speaking about time um and <laughs> I'm just gonna wrap it up quick of I look forward to talking more about time and how that how that concept really does play into the quantum field plays into the manifestations plays into learning and knowledge and just being here in this dimension so with that, everyone, blessings and abundance to you all. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and have a delightful rest of your day, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And I will see you soon. Bye.